first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of John Blockley, um, an ex survey geology who sadly passed away a few weeks ago. Um, he's the one that approached me uh, when we were both on the committee of the Earth Science History Group to put together something for the 2014 um, Earth Science Convention and uh, ask for help in looking at what was in the collection. Um, and that's how my interest in it started. This talk is partly the same talk, but also there's some new material in it. What is the glass plate negative collection? Is a record, Victoria record, of WA um, geology and mining um, for a period that goes from 1896 to 1928. Very much at the beginning of the um, history of the survey. There are nearly 1,800 um, glass plate negatives, so I'm not going to talk about all of them. They exist, um, obviously, as negatives, but we also have some art copy prints, and many of these images are now in digital format, not all of them. We often get requests for usage of these images, and we are quite happy for people to, um, to use them, provided they are knowledge of the source. The copyright does, however, reside with the um, department. The geologists who took these pictures would have carried something like these fairly cumbersome, bulky cameras in the field. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any of these cameras in our um, historical material collection. But I'll get back to this point a little bit later. This is what the collection looks like. Um, maybe you should come a bit closer. Um, it's, um, there are a number of very sturdy wooden boxes um, that sit in our library. The collection was offered to the uh, State Library of Western Australia, uh, who declined to house it. So it is in Mineral House. Um, that's one of the inside of the boxes. And the slides themselves come in various sizes, from um, fairly small, about a sort of card size, to um, occasionally over 30 centimeters. They are, as you can imagine, quite fragile. So we don't like to handle them too much. In addition to the negatives themselves, we have a, the original register um, and a set of our copy prints that must have been uh, made um, not long after the um, slides were actually acquired. From the original register, we developed a simple Excel spreadsheet, which is just a translation of what's in the register. And in addition, we, um, if we do any research on any of these photos, we may add information about where the photo was used, in what publication, any other type of information that we can find. The ones that get digitized, I'm sorry, scanned, um, are also put into um, an internal database to make searches um, a lot easier. If we look at the collection um, in its entirety, um, you will see that about three quarters of the photos are from the field. And about a quarter are laboratory photos, in other words, samples and thin sections. Very little um, is um, left for pictures of stuff and some really odd bits um, that don't fall into these categories. If we look at the people who took the photographs, you see there's quite a few of them. Um, and this is also breakdown by category. So you will see that Tarbot and Bletchford took the large majority of the photos in the field, whereas Simpson and Ferguson um, took most of the lab photos. Now, I'm not going to cover every single photographer. Uh, I'll just um, focus on some of them. The first one is perhaps not a very well-known name in the history of the survey. It's Sebastian Bescher. Um, he was a topographical surveyor and then became a mining inspector. He only took 12 photos, but these are the ones um, that appear to be the oldest. And that's why we've been um, singling him out. His photos come mostly from the Pilbara and document some of the mining activity and prospecting that was going on um, at the turn uh, of the 19th century into the 20th century. 
this is a picture of uh, Manas um, working on alluvial dirt, um, a nullagan. And this particular picture was used on one of the geological survey Christmas cards. The Christmas cards were produced uh, from a period uh, from 1888-89 to 1916-17. In other words, uh, pretty much during the war. And that, then they stopped. Um, but the images that uh, the photographers that collected were used uh, for these cards. This is one of the simplest cards. Um, some are very elaborate with really uh, quite intricate um, drawings and um, graphics. This is another image from the same photographer. The gold work is in the Nolagan conglomerate, which is now the Beaton Creek member of the Hardy Formation. And again, just documenting um, the work that was happening at that time. Let's move on to Tarbot. Um, as I said, he was one of the most prolific photographers. We got 218 um, pictures um, next to his name. He was quite a, an interesting character. Um, he was born in Cork in Ireland, received some education in New Zealand, and then moved to um, WA, probably when, about, when he was about 18, 19. He joined the survey in 1899. Prior to that, he worked in the government camel farm in Kugadi. He had a bit of a career in the survey. Uh, he did not have any formal qualification as a geologist, um, so he started working as a, a temporary assistant, graduating then to assistant, <coughs> then obviously picking up some skills by being out with um, other um, ge um, geological survey stuff. He then became a topographic surveyor, and in um, 1911, he became an assistant field geologist, and eventually was promoted to field geologist in 1914. He left the survey in 1920 uh, for medical reason, and joined the private sector, working for um, oil companies and Western Mining Corporation. About 50, 52 of um, his photographs were taken um, during his um, reconnaissance along the Canning Stock Route. Now, most of you will know about the Canning Stock Route, but in case um, someone is not familiar with it, this is a um, route that covers something like 1,800 kilometers from Weluna to um, Oles Creek. And I should have pointed out this on previous slides too. These stars indicate um, where some of the pictures are taken or the area I'm talking about. The route was open because the government wanted to uh, break the monopoly of the West Kimberley farmers um, on meat production. The East Kimberley farmers could not um, take their cattle on ship because they had a tick and it was thought that the tick may survive the trip by sea. Therefore, the government decided to open a um, land route. So after Canning was sent in 1906, 1907 to survey this road, and eventually a well sinking expedition um, was organized. Talbot was asked to join this expedition to provide some geological um, mapping in a strip about 250 um, kilometers wide on the side of the route. So it was quite a well-defined um, task. He joined the party um, and left Wiluna on the 4th of September 1908, reaching Oles Creek in 1909. When he got there, he received a telegram that instructed him to carry on and investigate the gold fields in the Tanami into the Northern Territory. So, he proceeded to do that and spent a total of 427 days in the field, which is by far the record for any survey geologist. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you just some pictures of what he took photographs of um, during this um, expedition. There's a lot of springs, which are obviously uh, points where the party will rest. Um, this is the gorge below Kilogara Spring, and there's a little tent there. Uh, obviously, the geologist's camping. 
another image, obviously a favorite spot because you can see a nearly identical image taken by Roger Hawking in 2004 and nothing much has changed. They were obviously um, documenting some of the Aboriginal paintings in the area. And some of the native wells, and again, one of the camps. Um, and you can see here said um, horses on this particular um, trip. This photograph is interesting because it actually shows one of the cameras that the party was carrying. The party will actually work um, separately from the rest of the expedition. Um, Talbot will go with, um, um, I just better get my numbers right here. He will travel with um, two riding camels, one assistant, provisions for four to five weeks, and about 55 liters of water. He will leave the main party at one of the wells um, travel for about four or five weeks and then rejoin the party at a um, well further um, along the road. Um, there's not just pictures of um, the geologist um, camps. This is a picture of the, one of the miners' camps. Um, at that time, we are up in the Tanami, the second part of this expedition. And again, just documenting the uh, conditions um, of these um, people out in the bush. And this is a picture from the return journey, again, Palm Springs. I don't know if you can appreciate that's the scale. Um, that's the Talbot himself, we think, um, providing some scale in this image. Also, obviously, pictures of some of the local people that were encountered during the trip. Corsi Clark, um, unlike Talbot, had a proper formal education in geology. He also took quite a lot of photographs under the 13. He was a graduate from New Zealand that worked in the survey from 1913 to 1920, and then moved on to WA, uh, first as a lecturer in charge and then as a professor. He took part with um, Talbot on the Leverton Warburton expedition. This was um, an expedition that um, was decided because um, a prospector had sent some samples to the survey his name was Frank Hahn, and he had recognized that some of these samples looked very similar to rocks in the gold fields. And some did, in fact, return some um, gold content. So it was decided to go and explore these totally unknown area geologically to see whether there was, obviously, um, the possibility of some mineralization. So, um, and again, I just would like to quote the precise number. I think that... Uh, hold on. Uh, two geologists, four assistants, and 16 camels took part in this expedition. They left Laverton in June 1916 and reached the Warburton Range area by August. At this point, they set up a camp from which they were going to do traverses to uh, map um, a large area. But the camp was attacked on September 10, and Talbot received some minor injuries, and one of the assistants, Johnson, uh, was quite severely wounded. So they had to um, take him back to Laverton, and this delayed the whole expedition by about a month. Despite this setback, they managed to map something like uh, 1,500 square miles of this area. And I'll just show you some pictures of the type of things they saw. Again, springs is uh, obviously a popular topic. Um, some of the ones they documented actually have an extra historical um, point of interest. Spring granite, represented here, was used by John Forrest um, in an expedition from the WA coast to the Adelaide Darwin um, telegraph line in 1874. 
This is one of the images of the um, survey geologist camp and one that we have used on the cover of one of our um, records. Another rock hole of historical interest was one that was discovered by Ernest Giles, one of the early explorers in WI in 1873. And the picture of a sample, which is, uh, we think, the first evidence of Permian glaciation documented in uh, Western Australia from the Wilkinson Range beds. This is a famous picture in the survey. It's quite an evocative picture. It shows the camel train on the return journey. And it also shows that the fragility of some of these lines, some of these negative, that's a crack. Obviously, all of these can be digitally retouched. Um, but um, it's still worth knowing uh, the conditions in which these negatives um, are. This is my last photographer. Um, it's one that we will talk in terms of the amount of photographs taken, um, negatives. 212 have got his name against them. He was a graduate at Sydney University. He worked with the survey for about 20 years intermittently, he was doing a bit of consulting uh, in between. And he was also a government geologist uh, from 1927 to 1934. I'm just showing a few pictures that he took from the 1912 um, Pilbara expedition, which was a three-month survey that again documented some of the um, mineral workings in the area. Some of the classical localities in the Pilbara, Copping Gap, will be known to most of you. And the Mount Cassitera tin mine at Wajina, which was at that time the only underground mine in Western Australia. And this is just to show some of the conditions that um, affected these travelers. Um, I'm sure you can sympathize if you have got dog or had problems with your vehicle getting stuck in the sand. This is in particular was at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning. That's the last bit I'm going to say about specific photographer. What I'm going to do in the next part of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, specific um, type of um, slides that touch on specific topics, and I'm going to show you some of the um, rocks and um, thin sections. This particular one uh, are two slides that depict the Lake Clifton thrombolites. I was approached by Kat Gray after she found out I was giving this talk, and she showed you need to talk about these two slides. The reason for this is that um, the survey organized an expedition in the Lake Clifton area to assess some of the limestone deposits. There was a farmer there who was mining some lime, and they thought that there was potential for an extension of what he was mining. So he sees St. Smith, went out and did a bit of work there, uh, looked at Lake Clifton in great detail, and in his um, in the annual report from 1912, he put this comment, and I'll read it for you if you can probably can't read it from where you are. Especially along the eastern shore, small circular patches of fairly compact lime are forming as a result of the growth of colonies of small organisms. But the deposit appears to be entirely superficial. Now, and I'm quoting Kat Gray here. She thinks that, although obviously the term stromatolite has not been used, um, they're clearly referring to some microbialite. And the term stromatolite um, had been in use since 1908, but the first stromatolites described in Australia um, that she is aware of are just the ones in Alice Springs by Chewing, 1914. So in fact, this annual record is probably the very first description and the photo that go with it um, of living microbial arts in Australia and possibly in the world. Um, and this precedes the Shark Bay uh, description by decades. So let's move on to some of the rocks and minerals that were photographed um, in the collection. There's a number of gold nuggets, uh, obviously all black and white. 
uh, most of them have got uh, two pictures, an obverse and reverse um, aspect. This is the Friendly Creek Nugget. Uh, some of these nuggets have a scale uh, with numbers attached to them, some unusual number. Um, I've asked a few people and no one was really able to tell me much about um, what these numbers mean effectively. So if anyone has got any idea, I'd like to hear it. The Friend with a Creek Nugget, um, as I was doing a bit of a search on internet, um, is an interesting one. I unearthed this little snippet from the Kalgoorlie Manor in 1902. Um, apparently it was a 400 ounces nugget, but no one ever saw it, so they thought it could have been an ox. Although eventually some smaller pieces were brought into Robun um, today. And this is a colored version. We are not quite sure when that was made and by whom, possibly quite recently. These are two other nuggets, the Abbott School Garden Nugget and the Woods Nugget. Um, interestingly enough, um, the database for the collection of gold nuggets does not have names with it, only numbers. But I'm sure that if we were to compare them, we'd be able to find some specific references. These two were described in GSWA bulletin number six, and um, there's a table that details these and others that provides information about their value, their weight, and in, for this particular two, an indication that they were sent to the Glasgow exhibition, the second one, in 1901. Let's talk a little bit about meteorites. A bit of a step back from the negative collection now, and just um, give you a few points about uh, the discovery of meteorites in Western Australia. Um, most of this information is from um, Alex Devon, 2006 publication. He reckons that the earliest find of a, a meteorite in WA was 1884, uh, east of York. This is the so called Yanjigin meteorite, named after the police outpost in the area. And the largest one is currently at the WA uh, Museum and was uh, recovered in 1954. From 1897 to 1939, Simpson, who is, uh, was a chemist and mineralogist at the survey for quite a long time, he described and recorded and analyzed many of the meteorites that were brought um, into the survey, to the point that uh, Bevan identifies him as the father of the state meteorite collection. There were 48 meteorites described in the catalogue of Western Australian meteorites published in 1965, and these were mostly on meteorites. In 1972, a supplement identified 92 uh, with some stony meteorite addition. Currently, the Western Australian Museum has got about 14,000 specimens that come from um, 750 different meteorites. And these 14,000 um, specimens cover most of the known types of meteorites. These are some of the pictures in the collection, the glass plate negative collection. And here you can see how they've been named. Uh, and in some of the localities. Again, like the gold nugget, back and front images. This is the one that um, I spent a little bit of time researching, purely because I wasn't aware of Mount Dooling as a locality in WA. Um, this particular meteorite was discovered in 1905, five miles east of Mount Dooling. So I went into the get the tier of localities for Australia um, and couldn't find a Mount Dooling, although there is a Dooling Sock, which I presume is from the same area. This is in the center of the Ilgan, pretty much, um, and it's not far from the Mount Manning, Mount Manning um, Reserve. The Mount Dooling meteorite, a tale of many pieces, is described in GSWA Bulletin 48, where the first mass mass that was recovered in 1909 was weighing um, 31 kilos, 31.4, but two pieces are being broken off by the person who found it um, through a hole in the meteorite. 
and I'll show you in this picture. That's the little hole. One of the pieces about from the ground was then presented to the Australian Museum in Sydney. The Gosnell on meteorite, um, which was um, 1.5 kilo discovered in 1960, it's Gosnell in a third, turned out to be chemically and um, structurally similar to the Manduling meteorite, as was the um, Manmeni meteorite. Uh, which was recovered uh, in 1972, I think. So different meteorites that receive different names do in fact belong to the same um, body. And a bit of a web search unearthed this piece, which is now in the United States. Um, this piece was brought to the museum in 1997 by John Emmott. It was about 30 kilos and the museum recognized it was similar to the Mount Dooling meteorite, but did not retain the specimen. And John Emmont eventually obtained a permit for exporting it. And I think it sits now in the um, University of California, Los Angeles. The group that maintains this website, interestingly, seems to be associated with this museum. And they're certainly advocating for not destroying meteorites when people find them, which is something that some commercial people tend to do. This is the last few slides from the glass plate negatives that I'm going to show you. Um, the example of the thin sections that were cut at the time. As you can see, the petrographic details are quite um, noticeable despite the early days of petrography. This is possible partly because glass plate negatives um, are actually very good in capturing images to the point that um, although film eventually came on board in the 1920s, 30s, they, they were still used by astronomers up to the 1990s because they can capture um, light even when there is a very small proportion of light and uh, they are very good in that respect. There are some things that you have to be a bit careful um, about when you look at this collection. Not all the information is complete. In some cases, we don't know the locality uh, where the picture has been taken. We don't know who took it um, and not even exactly the subject of the photo. In some cases, the information in the register, uh, we think it's not terribly accurate. All of these three photos were are dated at about circa 1893. But um, when you look at the subject of this photo, this one and this one are from Daydon, a town that was gathered in 1894. Um, and you can see the town obviously was quite well established. Similarly, the Lawler's Clifton Street, as this um, negative is labeled, um, must have been taken after the town was gathered in um, 1896. And we were not able to find any record of survey geologists going to these areas on official business. So we're not quite sure why these photos were taken. Sometimes there is more information on the actual print than in the catalog. Both these images are labeled simply Lakeway in the register, but there are interesting um, snippets of information. This one is labeled a pleasant health resort, a lakeway, and this one indicates the picture was taken in the early morning at Lake Violet, which is part of Lakeway. And you can see a party of uh, people hunting there. And this is really what I'm going to leave you with. Despite these um, little issues, uh, we think that this is uh, an incredibly valuable resource to document the early history of um, geological um, excursions, uh, geological observations, and uh, mining. I haven't really touched much upon um, the mining slides, but there are um, images of a mine underground, uh, wells being dug, uh, and lots of prospectors and, um, and miners. Thank you. <laughs>